it is a picture of them being buried and dead into their sin. And when they come up out of the water, Christ has made them into a brand new creature. Amen? I have a brother with me this morning, Brother Robert Atkins. I'm going to ask him to come on down here. Brother Robert came to me last Sunday. He said that he accepted Jesus Christ in January of 2021. And uh, his wife is the one who led him to the Lord. Amen. He approached a couple of churches about being baptized, and for because of COVID's reasons and so forth like that, they were not baptizing, and he wanted to know if we would baptize him. So I sat with him after the church and talked to him about salvation and what it meant, and uh, he and I have agreed. He truly knows the Lord as his Savior. So, Robert, let me just ask you a few questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? Do you believe that he rose again the third day? Yes, I do. And he's in heaven now. Have you made him Lord and Master of your life? I have. Okay. And do you believe that one day he's coming back to receive you into himself? I believe he is. I believe he is. Do you rejoice with that this morning? Yes. yes. If you want to stand in honor of Brother Robert, would you please do so? Brother, come this way if you would. In obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, it's my privilege baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his life. Raised in newness of life. Hallelujah. Amen. What way to start off this morning, huh? I'm just really excited to worship him now after seeing. Amen. Aren't you excited to worship our Lord this morning? Let's remain standing as we, continue, as we worship our, our Lord this morning.
you so thankful that we are in a place to where we can freely worship our Lord? Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We want to see you this morning. just take them in to the entrance and give them to a nurse or somebody to carry them on in. But we also 
give lots of robes to our church family that has loved ones who have cancer or a, an illness. So we've given out many, many robes, and we love it. And every robe that's made, I want you to know, is made with love, okay? We have wonderful ladies. Where did thy ladies go? They're supposed to be sitting out there. Here's that. <laughs> Okay, these, these are some, Pam Strasser helps us, and she's sick today, so she won't be here. But they want to display some that we've made this last time. We, we went completely out, and we've made some more. But um, I would like to encourage any of you that would like to be a part of it, that uh, whether you sew or not, you can still learn. We have sewing machines that's given to us that are back there. So you don't even have to have a sewing machine if you want to come and participate. The second Saturday of every month from nine till 12 is when we do that. And um, uh, one, one time I told you about, we did go in to where they were having chemo and Carol's gonna come up here and tell us. Uh, she talked with the people after we left that day. Where are you, Carol? <laughs> <laughs> want to encourage if you do know how to sew uh, this means a great deal I know there's so many people here and uh, when I first started coming to this church part of my testimony is I had already lost my hair um, four years ago I guess it was four years ago I'm still recovering chemo brain um, I'd already had surgery and was under chemo and going through radiation and uh, very hard time wearing oxygen like uh, Mr. Bryan is over here, always gray uh, looking when I came into the church. And uh, I'll tell you, this church was phenomenal. The people that are currently here too, uh, absolutely phenomenal, uh, helping me get up the stairs and so on and so forth, getting around and teaching VBS. It was just phenomenal for someone that was so handicapped at that time. And I think that's the reason that uh, all the prayers and everything that, uh, that I'm semi-able able to get here today. But I do want to share this. Miss Geneva and I had gone out to Breast, Can Breast Cancer Centers of America. We went into, a f at the time before, uh, before COVID, we were able to go in and speak. So we have a room full of women and one man in the breast centers of America. So we're speaking, we have women crying, we have uh, women so touched by the blankets here shown, the lap uh, blankets. And so the women are receiving them and there's the one man who feels out of place, first of all, because he's in there with a bunch of women, sitting over in a corner. So Miss Geneva begins to leave. I'm beginning to say my goodbyes after hearing some of their stories. The man is still so quiet. So as I say my goodbyes, I go over and sit next to this man. I'm there for the next two hours. He had so much to say about men having breast cancer. Wonderful little man in his 60s with breast cancer. Most men at that age are looking for the red sports car, probably looking at younger women at that time, you know, that kind of thing. But not him, he was finding God and he was happy that a church was in there ministering to him because he was all alone. His wife had already left him. So that's when you know, when you read the scriptures and the angels are singing when one person is saved, it was that man that day because of this ministry in the breast center for women don't underestimate what god can do ever ever okay and that's my testimony for this gentleman so uh contribute uh, by 
your hands, sewing machines. I know Tommy is excellent at looking for uh, sewing machines. Um, and even if you can do things at home, if you have a sewing machine at home, absolutely, uh, you can work on things at home and bring it in as well. So it is a fabulous ministry. And if it weren't for this ministry, I would have been cold in mine too. I would have been cold in the chemo room. So thank you guys very much for listening to the story. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jerry wants to say something, and then we're through, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies. That I don't know if I have anything more to add than what's already been, but I just want to share something else with you. You don't need a machine. We can, we can get you a machine to work on. If you ever, if you've never even stitched a stitch, we can help you with that too. We have enough people here that know how to do it, and we'd be more than happy to teach you. So don't let any of those barriers keep you from attending and coming because we'd be happy to have you. So if you've ever thought, you know, you're, I'd like to try that, come on, just come. It's a nice time for fellowship, too. Love to see you guys. Men, too. There's a place for you here at Grassy Valley. Amen? There's a ministry here for you. In fact, I've... Uh, I was yesterday we were at the craft fair here, and I'll tell you more about that later. But I was talking to a person, and they said, So what's going on here? And I started sharing with them everything we were doing, including the quilting for a cause, and they were just overwhelmed. They said, How many people do you run in this church? I said, Well, probably on a really good Sunday, we run maybe 60, 65 on a really good Sunday. They went, And you're doing all of these ministries? And I said, God is working in our church. Yes. God receives all the glory. Amen? Yes. I'm glad you're here. Would you please stand together? Let's turn around and shake hands with those around you. Let's welcome each other to Grassy Valley Baptist Church this morning.
As you're making your way back to the seats, I just want to tell, sh share with you real quick. Yesterday we had a craft fair, and we had our, um, we had like, how many booths do we have here last, yesterday? 17 booths. We had 17 craft fair booths here uh, yesterday, and the f food trailer ministry, uh, Faith Riders ministry, received a little over $700 yesterday in donations towards uh, the Faith Riders and what happened yesterday. So it was a great turnout. Thank you for doing that and appreciate you being here yesterday. That was an awesome, awesome day yesterday. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, let's bless this offering together. Father, we thank you for this time of worship today. Lord, what a way to start off the service to testify of a life that has been given to you. Thank you, Lord, for worship. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. May we be faithful Lord, to continue to worship not only in our, from our hearts in singing, not only from the Word of God as we listen, but also through our giving. May you be praised. May you be worshipped. In Jesus' name, amen. How great is our God. How great he is. Let's stand as we continue to worship with Here I Am to Worship.
so much about worship here recently and it's not and worship is not just the songs that we sing Amen. but it's the heart that goes within it as the pastor talked about last week it's what's in our heart and what we give to the Lord not just in singing not just in prayer but in everything that we do and I want us this morning as we sing this song for us to come back and humbly confess to the Lord that he is worthy of all of our worship. And it's all about him.
texted Nathan earlier this week and asked him if he would do that song. It was on my heart. I'm not sure I'm going to get the story correctly. I'm, I'm going off of memory. and then My memory's not the greatest thing in the world. But um, from my understanding, and I've been a music director, so I know this would happen. Um, it's a large church. And um, like most music directors have, they have issues with people in their choir and people with, in the congregation that have talent. They'd have people that would sing in the congregation but not be in the choir. They had people that wanted to be in the choir that wanted the solos, and they had all these issues. And if you've ever been in a music director position, you have to choose people for solos, for choir specials, and for specials during the service. And there was a lot of people that were jockeying for positions to be soloists and to be noticed in fact a lot of times in a lot of churches um, it's all about the people that are singing rather than about Jesus Christ himself and so the pastor had gotten wind of it the music director was broken over it worship had become a show rather than worship so the pastor made an executive decision. He said, no music for the next month. None. We're going to come to church. We're going to spend time in prayer. We're going to open the Word of God. We're going to preach. But we're not having any music. No choir. No band. No nothing. Just to wipe away. To start afresh. To start anew. And it was during that period of time that the music director wrote that song. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. Bringing something that's of worth that will bless your heart. That's the heart of worship. Last week, we began looking at the passage in John chapter 4. If you'll continue to go with me, please. John chapter 4, verse 19. We've been looking at the woman at the well, and I don't want to stop today. I want to continue looking at this important topic of worship. I've had some people praying for me this morning, and if I break from my message, don't be surprised, okay? Um, we've been talking about the living water. We've been talking about worship. We've been talking about Jesus Christ. And I look forward to next week because we're going to continue looking at this passage again next week, even though it's Mother's Day. I think it's very important 
this woman at the well is very important in Scripture. I believe that Jesus is doing more than just talking about worship here. The whole main thrust, really, is Jesus witnessing to her, sharing with her the kingdom of God, living water. And as we looked at this last week, we already know the passage. If you want to go back and read it for yourself, that's fine. You understand that she's, uh, she's there at the well. She's a Samaritan. He, Jesus, by all means and purposes, shouldn't even be talking to her. They have uh, issues with Samaritans. This is a woman on top of that. He's a rabbi. There's all kinds of social uh, problems here that would not be accepted by the normal institutions of that day. And yet Jesus breaks all of the traditions, breaks all the social norms because lives and souls are important. True worshipers are important. Amen? And Jesus is going to lead her to become a true worshiper. He tells her to go get her husband and she says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've been married five times, and the man you're living with now is not your husband, and she's blown away. What has Jesus done? Jesus has just introduced to her that he knows all things. He has shown her that he knows her sin. How many of you this morning would be embarrassed if Jesus were to walk up to you and tell you all about your sins this morning, your thoughts? your actions. I bet she was embarrassed. She was overcome. She was overwhelmed. I perceive you are a prophet. Maybe she was wanting to change the subject. I think I would want to change the subject. Get him off talking about something else other than my own sin. Maybe she's feeling the conviction. And maybe she's feeling the conviction so much that she really wants to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe she really wants to have a relationship with God. And so she says, where, do I, where am I supposed to worship? You guys say it's supposed to be in Jerusalem. We've been preaching all this time it's supposed to be Mount Gerizim. Where's the true place of worship? She's so convicted of her sins. And by the way, can I say this? Conviction of sins is very important in evangelism. Because without that, there is no repentance. And without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Amen. Jesus is sharing with her how she can enter into the kingdom of God. Recognition of repentance and sin is necessary. So she redirects the subject matter to worship. And I think that now she's being... She's being really honest. I want to have a true relationship with God. How can I be forgiven? Listen, according to the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books of the law. That was it. They didn't, they didn't accept the, pro, the, the prophets. They didn't accept the Psalms. They did not accept the writings. All they accepted were the first five books. And so she wants to know, where's the true place of worship? And in the first five books, God lays out the law, what worship is all about. Worship is all laid out right there. God has a prescription for it. He had priests. He had sacrifices. They had rituals they had to go through. This was all laid out in Scripture for them in the Old Testament law. So they had a way to worship. God had given them the way to worship Him, the way to be forgiven of sin. To have a relationship with him. So look down to verse 19. Let's read the passage again. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers, our fathers, worshiped in the mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. 
And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Last week we touched briefly on unacceptable worship, and I don't mean to be negative, and I don't want you to come away mad this morning, but I do want to touch some more on unacceptable worship. Not to point the fingers at other churches, because I have a tendency to do that. God woke me up last night about a little after 3 o'clock, and I've been awake since. I've prayed, and I've prayed over this sermon. I've prayed over you this morning, and I've prayed over this, and God began to show me, Mark, you've got to stop pointing the fingers at everybody else's faults. And we are. I get, I get I believe, believe me, I get righteously angry at other churches and the way that they don't worship the Lord. I, I'm, I'm righteously angry at issues facing the church today. But God showed me it begins with me. It has to hit home with me first. It has to hit here first. Because believe it or not, church, we are not without excuse. Okay? We're not without excuse. So let's look at this. I want to look at some false worship things real quick. What is false worship? Worship, false worship is worship that worships anything other than God. Now I know that it's a familiar truth. Any worship of any other anything other than the true God will not be accepted by God. We know the the Ten Commandments, right? The one commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. My glory will I not give to another. What kind of gods do we have, church, that we worship? You say, well, Brother Mark, I don't have any graven images in my, in my house. Or do we? I don't have any graven images in my house, Brother Mark. I don't have any graven images in my house, Brother Mark. And yet we pull out the phone. We will spend more time on the phone than we will in His Word. We'll spend more time watching TV than we will worshiping God and learning more about Him. We will do everything else. I've seen people worship sports. I've seen people worship their children. I've seen people worship everything else but God. And we don't call it graven images because, well, it's not an idol, but we've made it more important than God. And anything that we worship or we put as more important than God, we've made into a graven image. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. When you live a life holding everything else as more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to re-examine what you're worshiping. Number two, worshiping God in a man-made form or false form. This is making God to be something that he is not. For example, Exodus chapter 32, while Moses was up on the mountain getting the law written on tablets from God, The children of Israel were doing what? They were melting down their gold and making a golden calf to worship. They weren't worshiping another God. I want you to understand something. They were not worshiping another God. And I'm I'm going to prove this by what the Scripture says. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 8. The Lord speaks to Moses and says, They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. In a bizarre act, the children of Israel decides that the God that split the Red Sea, the God that delivered them from Israel, is not happy with with not seeing a God 
that is talking to them. I can't get that through my mind because they see a cloud by day, they see a pillar of fire by night, yet somehow it's not enough. They have to have something in front of them, so what they want to do is bring God down to a level that they can understand. And I've always tried to wrap my mind around this. I was like, Why, how can you go from seeing a, a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day, how can you see a God that splits the Red Sea, how can you go from that to a golden calf? You're making up a God. And, 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 and finally I've learned that they weren't making up a new God, they were just trying to bring God down to a level that they could understand. You say, well, how do you get that? Well, you can go all the way... Further down the Old Testament, they try to do it again. When, when, the, when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split, do you remember this? Jeroboam is called to be the king of northern Israel. What does Jeroboam do? Jeroboam says, well, we're not going to have the, we don't have Jerusalem anymore, so we've got to have our own place of worship. So he moves the place of worship up to the northern kingdom, now he them, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship God up here, and we're going to make golden calves for you to worship. Why golden calves? What's so important about calves? Listen, here's what, here's what it was. In an agricultural society, cows are the main source of food and power. They plow the fields. They provide the meat. They provide the milk. They provide the cheese. They provide the butter. They provide the, the way of substance. And so in agricultural society... Cows were important. Cows were strong. Cows were mighty. And so they looked at God as being mighty, as a provisionary. And so they looked at cows and said, we're going to make God into something that we can understand. And church, I'll be honest with you. There are times that we try to bring God down to our level so that we can understand him. If I were to explain to you today the attributes of God and His sovereignty, you would not understand it. When we had 9-11, people filled the churches and they wanted to know why would God allow that, that to happen, right? And when men of God would get up and preach God's sovereignty, people were going, that can't be. You have people today asking, how can a loving God send people to hell? It's because they don't know that he's also a God of justice. He's righteous. Yes, he is merciful, but he's all the other things too. And until we come to a full understanding of who God is, we'll never worship him correctly. We're always going to try to bring him down to our level so that we can understand him. And if I were to preach to you all the attributes of God, many of you would say, that's not the kind of God I want to worship. Because I want to worship a loving God. I want to worship a merciful God. I want to love, I want to love a worship, a, a God that, that understands and forgives everybody. But God is righteous and he's holy and he's just. And we may not understand everything about him, but I'm going to tell you something. If you want to, start diving into this, and you'll start finding out a whole lot more about God than you realize. Amen? Oh, church, we've got to bring God back up to where he was. We've got to lift him back up to where he was. We can't bring him down to our level. It's not possible. That's false worship. In the Old Testament, God gave clear instructions on how he was to be worshipped. In Leviticus chapter 10, you have two different priests, one by the name of Nadab and Abihu, who come before the Lord and offer a strange fire. What does that mean, Brother Mark? Well, that's just basically they brought something to the altar that was not supposed to be there. It was not something God didn't want them to bring. It was not prescribed by God. In the Old Testament, God laid down very specific patterns for the priests to follow in worship. The point was to let everybody know that God cares about how you worship Him. Let me get something clear, please. And you may say, Brother Mark, you're petty, you're silly, you're childish. 
But I've accused Ben. I've been called all that before in my previous churches. Because I'm going to tell you something. I stopped. I stopped having the little birthday church in the front where they'd start off the service and they'd come up and say, if you've had a birthday today, bring your gift up here and let's sing happy birthday to you. And they'd come up and they'd sing happy birthday to them and I stopped it and people got, why are you doing that? I said, because that's not the place to worship people. We're here to worship God. That's it. And so when we come on Sunday morning, that's where we do it. We worship the Lord. If you want to have a birthday song, we'll sing it over in the fellowship hall. That's fine. We'll go outside. I love people, and I want to sing happy birthday, and I want to sing happy anniversary. I want to do all those things, but not where God should be worshipped as a group of people. Call me petty. Call me childish. But God has laid out in Scripture what worship is all about. So when we come to the New Testament, we better make sure we don't offer a self-made worship that God has not prescribed. Some of the early church fathers came up with what's called the regulative principle. In other words, if it's not prescribed, if it's not regulated in Scripture, we don't do it. We can't add more to it. What do you say what's in the Scriptures, Brother Mark? Well, the reading of God's Word. Prayer, the Lord's Supper, baptism, singing a new song unto the Lord, making melody in your heart to the Lord, encouragement, fellowship, those are all acts of worship that we can do in the church. But if we do something outside of that, then we're not living up to what worship is. We're making things up. And it's unacceptable. It's false worship. Thirdly, worshiping God hypocritically. We pointed out in Matthew 15, the Lord was talking to the Pharisees and scribes. I pointed this out last week. Down in verse 7, he says you, to them, you hypocrites, rightly did, I, did Isaiah prophesy of you. And then he, then he quotes Isaiah 29, verse 8. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. So in verse 9, it says, In vain, in vain do they worship me. It's empty worship when your heart is far from where your lips are. Now let me point something out about the word vain for just a moment. I touched on it briefly a little bit last week, but let me just cover a little bit more. Whenever... Whenever we lower God to be anything less than holy, anything less than righteous, anything less than sovereign, anything less than full of justice, anything less than full of mercy, whenever we do anything to bring God down to a lower level, we have taken his name in vain. Wait a minute, Brother Mark, I thought it was just using the... the the GD. I thought it was just using words. I, I thought it was cursing him. That's part of it. We'll get to that. Church, you please understand, it's taking God's name in vain goes far deeper than just words we say. It's actions we do as well. It's the heart. Listen, taking the Lord's name in vain. Here's one of the ways. Cursing his name. Leviticus 24, verse 15. If anyone curses God, then he shall, swear, he shall bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. Stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Anything that assaults the holiness of God, anything spoken about God that in any sense assumes that he is evil, is to curse God or blaspheme God. To think of God as evil would to be think of God as unfaithful, unloving, unwise, la uh, lacking in compassion, lacking in mercy, lacking in power. Anything said against the glory of God, any accusation that God is of some way flawed is taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Listen, after 9-11, we had preachers get up and say, I don't think that God would ever allow anything like this to happen. This is out of his control. That is taking the name of God in vain. 
Because God is in control. If he's not in control, who is? Me? I'm going to mess it up. I mess up my own life. How can I mess up? Who's in control if it's not God? I would much rather have him be in control. Amen? Amen? You say, well, Brother Mark, is this God's will that Russia invade Ukraine? Listen, God is in control over all things. If God is not in control of all things, then God is not in control of anything. Cursing his name. Swearing by his name falsely is another one. When you're telling a lie, but you want people to think you're telling the truth. So you bring the name of God to validate it. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth. That's using the holy name of God for evil purposes. Leviticus 19 verse 12 says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of the Lord. I am the Lord. Number three, to falsely prophesy or falsely speak for God. When you say speak for God and you have not heard from him, you are using the holy name of God to validate your deception. Jeremiah 23 verse 14 talks of prophets of Jerusalem who have done a horrible thing. They've committed adultery, walking in falsehood, strengthening their hands of evildoers. They were wicked prophets. If a person stands in the pulpit and says that they have a word from the Lord, it better be a word from the Lord. I'm going to tell you, church, you need to watch what you're watching on YouTube right now. Be careful. So many people are caught up in this prophecy junk. And these guys are getting on YouTube and on Facebook and saying, God's doing this and God's doing that. And I had a vision last night and I had a dream last night. And I've caught so many of them now that have said that this is going to happen by this date, and it doesn't happen, and it's a false prophet, and I've written them, and I've told them so. You're a false prophet. You need to shut your mouth. Amen? They're false. If you have a word from the Lord, it better be true. Otherwise, you're taking the name of the Lord in vain. I've spent some time now on what we should not do. So let's get back to the passage. The woman asked Jesus, where's the true place of worship? Jesus points out that how and who you worship is more important than where. And again, worship is first and foremost an experience of the heart, as Nathan reminded us this morning it's not the music it's not the time that we spend singing worship is from the heart prayer without a worshipful heart is vain songs without a heart that's worshiping him is in vain confession and creeds and liturgies and sermons that don't come from the heart are empty and worthless in God's eyes. Jesus says to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. She was associating God with a place she says, we worship here, Mount Gerizim. Their temple had been destroyed in 125 B.C., but there were some remnants there. And so only the, the people that were still that were in that area were still trying to worship there, still sacrificing, still following the laws. The Jews were worshiping in Jerusalem, and God was never confined to Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus says, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. What is that hour? Well, the hour of his cross, the hour of his resurrection, the hour of the ascension, the, the hour of sending the Holy Spirit back, the, the, the hour of the birth of the church. And then in 70 AD, the temple is completely destroyed. Not one stone is left upon another. 
The Samaritans had rejected all the Old Testament except for their version of the books of Moses and their knowledge of God was deficient and so their worship was deficient. He says, but an hour is coming. Listen, read this with me. But an hour is coming. And now is when the, say it with me, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Where do you go to worship God if God is spirit? You worship him anywhere and everywhere. He has a new temple. The temple is here. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we are the body of Christ, Paul says. We are the temple of the Spirit of God. God has taken up residence in us. The church is not where God lives. He doesn't live in buildings. He lives in his people. The church, if something were to happen to this building tomorrow, it would not be the end of Grassy Valley Baptist Church. Because Grassy Valley Baptist Church is not a building. Grassy Valley Baptist Church is the people. Amen? We're the body of Christ. I want to wrap this up by explaining the phrase, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Verse 23. The two words, spirit and truth, correspond to how and the whom of worship. Worshiping in spirit is the opposite of worshiping in mere external ways. It's the opposite of formalism and tradition. Worshiping in spirit refers to the inner self. It refers to the heart. In other words, worship can happen at any time. You don't have to have the mood music to worship God. There are people who think they worship because they feel the music, they feel the mood, and that music introduces them into worship. I don't find it anywhere in the Bible where in order to get worship going, you've got to play music. Music is a great avenue. I love music, and we are blessed to have good writers today that bring us to an understanding of who God is. But that's not what should bring you into worship. Your heart brings you into worship because you know who He is. Psalm 45, verse 1. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the King. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. In other words, the psalmist is saying, he takes out his tongue, as it were, and says, I like the pen of a ready writer. I'm liking it to that. I'm going to praise the king. I'm going to sing a song to the king with my heart. He says, overflows with a good theme. And here I go into worship. And Hebrew term there, overflows, means to boil over. That's the kind of spirit we're talking about. It isn't about the right time or place or the right stimulation. It's about the heart. Worship comes from an overflowing joy of what Christ has done in your life, of what God is doing in your life. Even through the hard times, it's still joy. And you can still worship. That's why we can still worship God even during trials because we know what God has done. Amen? That's what worship is. It's it's an overflow. It boils over in our heart. Worshiping in truth is the opposite of worship based on an inadequate view of God. I want you to get this. If you don't get the rest of this, please get get this. Together with the words of spirit and truth mean that real worship comes from the spirit within and is based on the true views of God. Worship must have a heart, and worship must have a head. Worship must engage your emotions, and worship must engage your thoughts. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full of unspiritual pretenders. Emotion without truth produces an empty frenzy of emotions, which results in flaky people who have no idea what the truth is. 
And they want to bring God down to their own likeness. But true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deeply and sound doctrine. True worship doesn't come from the most moving melody. It comes from a true understanding of the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God. That's where true worship comes from. Listen, it's... Church, it's wonderful to have your spirit lifted up to cry tears of joy and let all your emotions flow, but always in response to the truth. Never in response to manipulation. But I don't want to go to the opposite extreme either. I don't want us to be so caught up in the liturgy and so caught up in the doctrine that we have no passion. One writer said, men have worshipped with open Bibles and with the name of Christ and the Bible on their lips while whole congregations have been held in the grip of barrenness and lifelessness and powerlessness. We can get so caught up in doctrine that we forget that there's a passion there too. Amen? Let me repeat what I said last week. Your worship, your praise can only go as high as your understanding of God goes deep. God is seeking true worshipers, worshipers that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you want to be a true worshiper, then dive deep into the Word of God and get to know the Father in a more intimate way because the time will come, church, listen to me, when the true worshipers will be noticed and false worshipers will fall away. The Bible says in the end times, that people will want their ears tickled. And there will be a falling away. And that's coming. It may be coming faster than you realize. I was going to end my sermon there. This morning when I woke up, and God began to work in me, pray, I didn't know where he was going. A friend of mine that you don't know, his name is, well, I won't, his name is Richard. Not this one. Richard Bowers is his name. Sends me a prayer every Sunday. He prays for me, prays for you. He's a godly friend. He sends me on messenger a prayer. He says, I'm praying this for you today. And this morning he sent me something that just shook me to my core because it makes true worshipers come to reality. I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to read an article to you. I'm not much into reading articles to the church because I believe the Word of God speaks for itself. It does. In fact, let me just say this to you. I heard a sermon this week. Ten indictments against the modern church. If you want to look it up on YouTube, I encourage you to do that. Very powerful message, but be prepared to listen for two hours. Okay. Ten indictments against the modern church. He says in there that we become a church where we're preaching more out of books, philosophy, and church growth how to become a better you, how to become a better husband, how to become a better wife, how to become a better father. Those are all good, but we're preaching out of books rather than preaching out of the Bible. The guy on there says, and he gives the illustration, I don't mean to take so much time, but he he gives the illustration of how he walked into a seminary room and they're sitting for the class and all of a sudden the professor walked in on the chalkboard he started drawing feet, footsteps going across the board and he said, church, he said, students, I'm sorry, he said, students, I'm hearing the footsteps of Aristotle and Plato more loudly and more distinctly in the halls of this seminary than I am hearing the footsteps of Paul and the apostles in Jesus Christ. The churches today are preaching more about philosophy and they're getting more of their information from psychology and they're getting all these church growth avenues and trying to teach it to the church and they're trying to be unique in the five sermon series on how to have a better ingrown toenail you'll get that later they're doing all these things to reach people where they live 
And they forget that the Bible is sufficient for everything we go through. You want to have a better marriage? Then know the God that put marriages together. You want to be a better father? Then know the God who himself is a father. Amen. You want to know how to make it through cancer? Get to know the healer. Amen? You want to answer financial issues? Talk to the God who says, Give and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given to you. Knock, it shall be opened. Get to know him. The Bible is sufficient for every answer we need in life. I don't need a church growth book anymore. Amen? And I'm going to tell you why, church, because the day is coming, and it's coming quicker than you realize, but the day is coming quickly where true worshipers are going to stand out and the false worshipers are going to fall away. God is seeking true worshipers, people that truly seek him, truly are moved by him, truly want to know him. And right now we're seeing all across America and around the world, we're seeing a movement of God in young people that are truly seeking God. I personally have seen it working in people I know, young people I know, that are tired of the show. They're tired of the false teachings. They want to know the real God, and they're diving into Scripture like never before, and they're learning more about God. In fact, some are even teaching me and reminding me that the Word of God is sufficient. You say, well, why do you, why do you say this is so important? This article he sent to me, true worship can, and I'll, I'll say this, true worship can bring joy in your life. True worship can bring comfort in your life. It can bring peace, and it can bring assurance into your life. But I'm going to tell you something, that's not why we worship. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's about him and him alone. True worship, true worshipers have to know God because of this very reason that I'm about to share. The following article, and you can write this down, it's found in www.opendoorsusa.org. Open doors or opendoorusa.org. You can check it out for yourself. Just type into the side North Korean killings. Christians were meeting in a secret worship meeting, North Korea. The guards arrested all of them and then executed every secret believer in the room. As is often the case in North Korea, the families of North Korean believers will suffer as well. It says in the article that our contact says that their families, exceeding 100 people, were also arrested and have been sent to a political prison where the inhumane conditions have been reported to be worse than those of the notorious Auschwitz concentration camp during World War II. Inmates are treated as animals, tortured, and forced to do harsh labor with little food. In North Korea, it is illegal to worship Jesus or have a Bible. For the last three decades, believers have been known and treated as the hostile class. Anything that gives people an alternative allegiance to the ruling Kim dynasty is deemed to be dangerous to the state. Christians must hide their faith even from their own children. As a result... Coming together to worship Jesus is a death warrant. And yet, as this report indicates, secret Christians are risking their lives to be a part of the church or own a, own, their own Bible. They're facing death to worship Jesus, knowing that their only hope is in Him. We don't recognize this in America because we've not been facing it yet. The day's coming. 
We've not recognized it yet because we live in a free society. We live in a free world where we can still come on Sunday morning and worship together. Praise the Lord. But you can see with me that when that day comes in America, true worshipers will be the ones that will be killed for their belief in God. They'll be ones that stand true because they know their God. Not always will deliver them from death, by the way. How many times we always we sing this, we, we preach it, God is there, He's going to deliver you from this, He's going to deliver you from that. Listen, that may not be God's will for you. Will you remain faithful because you know God's will is perfect? Will you remain faithful even to the point of death? Will you remain faithful? True worshipers remain faithful because they know the true God. And it's not by emotion because emotion is fickle. You worship God in spirit, we get excited. We get emotional because it's passionate in our hearts. We worship God in spirit, but we also worship Him in truth. Will you commit with me to ask God to forgive us of our shortcomings? Not only as a church, but in our own personal lives of how we have failed to be true worshipers. Lord, make us into true worshipers of God. To know Him intimately, deeply, passionately. Father, thank You for the truth of Your Word. Lord, I know I've been passionate about this. It hard, the worship is so important to me. And I know, Lord, even in my own life, I have failed you. Oh, the conviction that has filled my heart of how we've put things that's more important than you. God, forgive me. Forgive our church. Forgive this people. Forgive this nation. Help us, Lord, to to seek you wholeheartedly. To know you, to find you, to know you in a deep and intimate way. You said in your word, if we seek you, we will find you. If we seek with you for all of our hearts, may our hearts not be distracted. May the person in here that thinks they're too old to start over, realize that it's never too late. May the person that's too young, that hasn't experienced life, that's watching this program or watching this service, may they realize that now is the time to become a true worshiper. May I as a pastor, who sometimes can get arrogant and can sometimes get prideful in the, in the education that I've had, Father, don't let me get to the point where I don't learn how to become a true worshiper. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Let us be faithful. Let us change. Whether I have a year, a month, a day, ten years, it doesn't matter. Let me change. For your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said.